Therein lies the massive fundamental difference between sort of synthetic systems and living systems is that ability to be plastic. And in part, we built systems that aren't going to (laughs) change on purpose. We don't want them to change. Heaven forbid, should my car decide, you know, nah, I'm not going to do what you say, you know. I'm sorry, Hal, I can't do that. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm your host, Kevin Scott, Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft. In this podcast, we're going to get behind the tech. We'll talk with some of the people who made our modern tech world possible and understand what motivated them to create what they did. So join me to maybe learn a little bit about the history of computing and get a few behind the scenes insights into what's happening today. Stick around. Hello, and welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm Christina Warren, Senior Cloud Advocate at Microsoft. And I'm Kevin Scott. And today our guest is neuroscientist Tom Daniel. I had the chance to meet Tom a couple of months ago in one of these conversations that I've been having with a bunch of biologists and uh, bioscientists about their work. And Tom was showing me some of the really mind-blowing stuff that he's been doing in his laboratory on bioengineering and biomechanics at the University of Washington. And I thought he would just be an amazing guest to have on the podcast. All right. Well, I know that you two have a ton to talk about, so let's just get into it. Our guest on the show today is Tom Daniel. Tom has worked at the intersection of biology and engineering for more than 35 years. His research and teaching meld neuroscience, engineering, computing, and biomechanics to understand the control and dynamics of movement in biology. At the University of Washington, he's a member of the neuroscience faculty and a professor. Tom is a recipient of a MacArthur Genius Fellowship, and he received his PhD in biology from Duke and did postdoctoral work at Caltech. Welcome to the show, Tom. Great to be here, Kevin. I love to start these conversations by learning a little bit about how you first got interested in science in general, and maybe in particular, like how you decided that this interesting melding of uh, disciplines was the thing that you were passionate about. Sure. I I think it's uh, to some extent genetic. So I come from a family of... uh, uh, refugees and Holocaust survivors. I'm first generation U.S. Uh, so my parents directly had no college education, but my grandparents did. And my grandmother was a physician. She got her MD in 1913 uh, in Germany. And her relatives included uh, a lot of physicists. So um, we had this weird mix of medicine and physics growing up in the family. And, and so as a kid, that was sort of in, in the air as, as, as we were growing up. I never quite knew whether I wanted to do physics, biology, math, engineering. And to this day, I still don't know. That's where it all came from. And, and really, really good biology teachers in high school. And then in college, I sort of Never made up my mind, did a bit of engineering, did biology, just kind of spread myself over the place. Well, and and so talk a little bit more about that, because sometimes that can be a hard thing. Like we have in society sometimes and and like especially I think in some of our institutions, like we want to push people into like very specific directions. Was there anything Mm -hmm. that helped you? with this wonderful dilemma that you had of broad curiosity? Yeah. So I sort of have two responses. One is what helped me, but also I think the world has shifted since I was in uh, an undergraduate. As an undergraduate, I was, I remember distinctly taking an engineering class and there was a professor also sitting in on the class. This is very rare uh, at the time. And he happened to sit next to me, um, And he was a biologist wanting to learn more engineering. 
And we got to talking and uh, you know, I just found it fascinating that you could mix these two. There was no such thing as, as a bioengineering department. It did not exist back in uh, the time of Noah. <laughs> but uh, his name was Warren Porter and he melded physics and biology in a very interesting mixture of heat transfer and animals in different climates. And I just found that fascinating. After a while, he said, hey, do you want to join my lab and be a grad student? And I didn't actually know what graduate school was. Uh, I said, sure. And uh, so that that got me going in this interface. Um, I think today we are really doing more and more to break those barriers. So there are bioengineering departments. Um, and, and candidly, the word bio comes in front of lots of words. Now. <laughs> bioengineering. Yeah biomathematics, biophysics, biochemistry. So tell us a, a little bit about your research that you did as a graduate student. Yeah, I did two different things. So I, I started a master's degree at Wisconsin and I got my PhD at Duke. At Wisconsin, because I was really interested in fluid mechanics, that faculty member said, you know, fish swim really fast. Uh, why is that? And um, there was there was this theory uh, building in the literature that there's something novel about the polymer coating of fish, mm -hmm. mucus, right? And nobody had really looked at it in any uh, detailed way. And so um, he got me into his lab and we started doing fluid dynamics experiments on what was called polymer drag reduction. Mm -hmm. And I ended up publishing as a second year graduate student uh, a paper on polymer drag reduction, uh, the novel sort of chemistry and physics of the slimy covering of fish. That's where I and began. So <laughs> and, and so, like, you know, when, whenever I hear fluid dynamics, like I can sort of visualize uh, Navier-Stokes equations and uh, and my, my exposures to fluid dynamics has always been less about the analytical modeling and more about computer simulation of these systems. So were you doing uh, computer simulation stuff in your graduate work? Not then. Uh, so, Kevin, I have to remind you of ERA. <laughs> <laughs> this is the 1970s. Mm. And yes, I did computer simulations of flow in my undergraduate classes. It was Fortran. And we had to write our own numerical solutions uh, to very, very simple things. Okay. The project I work on, worked on in my master's was much more um, a mixture of experimental fluid mechanics and imaging flows. Okay. Oh, interesting. Then at Duke, I moved on to looking at a couple of different flow problems in biology. We got very interested in uh, the fluid mechanics of insect feeding, like mosquitoes, blood feeding, and things like that. What What is going on that allows the mosquito to feed on blood? How is this related to disease transfer, like malaria? What are the relationships there? And also locomotion in fluids, movement in fluids. And so it was a, a variety of things like that. And again, a mix of computational work and then uh, experimental work. I've seen a bunch of your work, which is just absolutely fascinating. So is your PhD work where you really started thinking about sort of the biodynamics of movement and how you could sort of combine these two disciplines, like how you sort of engineer things to navigate in the real world uh, inspired by biology? Absolutely. That work was done at Duke. And there was this sort of emerging area at the time. It was called comparative biomechanics that is looking to the engineering of living systems to figure out how they work, what are the rules governing how they work, and also as inspiration for novel engineering ideas. I worked on a couple different uh, aspects, some at the more um, cellular level of muscle force generation and what's going on at the level of molecules creating forces in, in, in muscle cells. And the other is muscles running movement in whole organisms. 
the thing that I was just blown away with is some of the work that you've done. And this is like skipping way forward uh, uh, on uh, like how insects uh, navigate the world where you're creating these uh, links between uh, their neurobiology and, uh, you know, sort of electromechanical uh, systems. But uh, but like g- give us a practical example of uh, like how you – um, like a, a real system that that you have engineered, inspired by uh, inspired by biology. So uh, maybe I have to take a little bit of a step back. So just to remind you that movement is sort of this 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 virtuous cycle of sensing the world, right? Mm-hmm. The information coming into a creature. That sensing is processed centrally by a brain. That brain information that is encoded has to be decoded into muscle actions, that is, controls of muscles. Those muscles have to produce forces and torques around joints and structures which propel the creature in space and therefore change the sensory information they're receiving. So there's this lovely cycle of what we call the sensory motor loop, right? Part of what we do is try and step in, in various steps along that pathway. How is the sensory information encoded? How do neural systems take information like forces or smells or light and convert that into signals that the brain understands, which are what we call action potentials? So that's part of what we're doing. So an example would be as insects fly around, they just like when we try and manipulate something or walk or or do any motor task, we have to acquire information about forces in order for us to regulate our motor tasks. One of the projects we've been working on is how insects measure forces uh, through novel structures. Now, this is going to go down a, a little bit of a gnarly path here, so bear with me. But when we experience rotations... We have a beautiful system in our inner ear called the semicircular canals. Mm -hmm. And those measure your body rotations through this really weird fluid flow problem of uh, endolymph in the semicircular canal spinning when we spin. And when we stop spinning, it keeps going. (laughs) Okay. And everybody can experience that. Insects don't have that. They do not have semicircular canals. Well, one could say that well, they don't need to measure their spin or they do it in a different way. And as it turns out, both the wings of insects and very strange derivatives of wings, which are found in flies, uh, they're called halteres, are packed with mechanosensory cells, neurons that measure the deformations of these structures, the deformation of a wing, the deformation of a halteer. Haltier is a hind wing of a fly turned mm-hmm. into tiny non-aerodynamic knobs that flap just like wings, but they're super tiny. And, and so what's their function? Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Like, no, are they correct. just are, are they just sensing uh, devices? Do they? Sure. They, the haltiers are purely sensory, right? Huh. They are derived from hind wings. They're like tiny dumbbells that the fly oscillates a counter phase to the wings. They're so small, there's no aerodynamic forces, but they're packed, they're festooned with sensory structures. As it turns out, they're they're like this little knob on a stick. And as that vibrates, it experiences bending forces. But if the fly rotates in a direction orthogonal to the flap, it generates a Coriolis force, a gyroscopic sensor. And lo and behold, these systems are exquisitely sensitive to rotational forces. So they're basically measuring, I apologize for the math, the cross product of their flap <laughs> with their body rotation, okay? Mm-hmm. And, and so we, we had this idea that they're able, or that physically able to respond to Coriolis forces, but we really wanted to nail whether the neural system actually has the equipment to measure that. And so we were able to stick electrodes into the neurons <laughs> that go into these tiny modified hind wings mm-hmm. and measured their encoding properties. 
And you can show that they encode information at astronomically high rates and do so for Coriolis forces. That, well, that sort of led to an interesting question is, these are what you would call a vibrating structural gyroscope, which is basically the same idea that you have in all these gyroscopic sensors in your cell phone or anything else. But they operate at a tiny, tiny fraction of the energy cost. I'm not going to stick a fly inside my cell phone, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but bear with me. We do some odd things like that. <laughs> so what, what you just described makes me uh, want to ask uh, a thousand questions, but, uh, you know, may, maybe an, an, an interesting one is in, in recent years, we have gotten better at better at being able to synthesize, to design and synthesize some of these biological structures. Uh, and so, you know, I, I know in a bunch of your uh, earlier work, when you were trying to sort of bridge this biological electromechanical gap, you were, you know, it, in a variety of ways, like trying to graft existing biological structures taken off of an organism into an electromechanical system. But like, do you think that there's a possibility now that we will be able to sort of engineer these structures a priori where you're not having to sort of borrow them in whole from a, an existing organism? That's a super question. I think it's possible. I, I have to be a little careful. Kevin, the, the hybrid system you're referring to is this hybrid system where we took the chemical sensory structures from an insect and removed it, which is called their antennae, put electrodes into the harvested structure, right? And then recorded its chemical responses, its responses to, to chemical signals, okay? And the reason we did that is getting close to the point you're, you're making, which is that we today cannot synthesize chemical sensors with the efficiency of sensing that we see in biological systems right? Okay, today. And the reason is there's this beautiful and elegant protein amplification pathway in chemical sensing, in biology, in humans, in dogs, and in insects, and in everything that senses chemicals, which is nearly every living creature. It, it just seems like just sort of an extraordinary potential thing, like this gyroscopic system that you were describing that is biological that probably outperforms like any of the, you know, so all our cell phones right now have a, have a gyroscopic MEMS, uh, you know, probably a, a, a MEMS device, which, you know, through some combination of micro machining and lithography and like a bunch of complicated mechanical processes do, do, does something miraculous, right? Like they are, they're far, far better better gyroscopes than the big ones that we had uh, 30 years ago, but they still are not even remotely approaching the performance, pr probably energy efficiency, uh, you know, like, and there, there may be other things that you could do with your biological uh, gyroscopic devices. And so like imagining how you might be able to use more biology to sort of synthesize some of these structures is, is very, is a very interesting uh, thought. Yeah, so let me let me pull on two threads. I think this, you bring up a really good point. Thread one is uh, the difference between these manufactured vibrating structural gyroscopes, VSGs, that are micro their MEMS devices, is they typically deploy in any one device relatively few sensors, it, meaning they're measuring six degrees of freedom, but typically with not many more sensors in them. In contrast, living systems have incredible redundancy. So in the fly, there's maybe just on one halt here, one little knob sticking off about a thousand sensors. Okay, maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe it's 800, <laughs> but it's a heck of a lot more than a handful. And the, the clues are twofold. One is the efficiency of information transduction is very, very high higher than in, say, transistor systems. And because of that, you can afford to deploy a lot of sensors. So redundancy is not expensive, and redundancy becomes an advantage. Okay, so that, that's sort of thread one. The, the, 
the conversion of mechanical energy into electrical potential, chemoelectrical energy, is very efficient in living systems. And efficiency, we still are trying to understand. That leads to your deeper question, which is, is there something we can fabricate that will get this level of efficiency? And the answer is probably. (laughs) Okay. The answer is that with protein engineering, can we build efficient protein systems that do the sorts of energy conversion out of thermodynamic equilibrium? That is utilizing energy, but in ways that are as efficient as we see in natural use of proteins. I think it's a fool's errand to try and recreate a cell, Mm -hmm. right? With all of the machinery and all of the all of the other chemistry that you need to replicate what we see. I think the smarter path will be an engineering proteins that can operate under sort of room temperature conditions. Right. Right. And and that's sort of one of the problems with your um your moth antennae example is they're they're perishable. So you can get the antennae off of the moths and graph them into this electromechanical system, but like they they have a very finite lifetime and, and they're fragile too, right? Uh, no, they're actually pretty robust. Um, we oh, well, we have high awesome. school students. No, 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 there's no problem uh, on, on fragility. And, and you're right. They have a finite lifetime. And as it turns out, so will any sort of biosensor that you have. Mm-hmm. I like to draw the analogy on things that use antibodies, for doing testing or anything that uses natural materials. It's usually a disposable cartridge or uh, things like a pregnancy test or an ELISA test or all of those things are sort of cartridges that you use. Whether we can get these to operate under longer terms, that's an open question. We are able to keep these going well longer than any robot lives. (laughs) So, uh, you know, we, just like the little teeny uh, robots that we fly them on, they have maybe a 20 minute lifetime. These sensors have hours. And mm-hmm. if you put them in the refrigerator, you keep them for weeks. I'm sort of curious uh, about another thing, which is um, the value of perspective of coming at things from different directions. So when you talk about these biological control loops, I flash back to the first uh, control loop that I learned about when I was a high school student, which is uh, a a temperature control loop that was based on this uh, notion of uh, proportional integral derivative uh, control, which to my high school mind, uh, just having taken my calculus class, like seemed like a really complicated thing. And I remember uh, it's a a funny thing that I was doing is I was working for this company that was trying to bootstrap itself as a circuit board manufacturing uh, company. And this was in the very early days of uh, surface mount manufacturing technology. And so you squeegeed a bunch of lead solder paste onto circuit boards. You placed these very tiny little components into this soft solder, and then you sent them through an oven to melt the solder and electrically and mechanically seat them to the circuit boards. And we didn't have enough money to buy an infrared reflow oven. So my boss gave me a GE toaster oven uh, and said, I need you to turn this into a reflow oven. Uh, and so that that was where I first learned about pig control. And it's it's super simple. Like it had a couple of inputs from temperature sensors. It had one output, uh, whether or not to turn a heating element on. It, it had a second output. It had a uh, convection fan, but like it was more or less on all the time. And the algorithm is relatively simple. So nothing in your world is even remotely this simple. I would hazard a guess. So from my electrical engineer's uh, point of view, I hear you talking about all of these things and I don't know where I would start. And like, I wonder if that's because I'm coming from this electrical engineer's perspective where I just sort of accept that this is the way things are in my, from my worldview and like, this is what's hard and this is what's easy. Do you think you benefited because you came from a biologist perspective on this uh, on this stuff? It, it, what what you're doing just seems very complicated. <laughs> yeah, um, it's complicated until you get in the weeds yourself. One of the things you can do is you ask, 
do animals do PID control on any sensor? I mean, it does. Is it that simple that they're measuring things like a gain and an integrator and a differentiator? Do they have all of these pieces? And and the answer is, how would you know? So I, I, I love this question because we actually try and find that out. The difference between the oven controller and an animal controlling its temperature, say, is that in the oven controller, again, you typically have one sensor, one sensory modality, and then on and off. You basically get hot, get not. And and how you deal with that sensory information, whether you use the, some gain on it or uh, some differentiator or some integrator, you know, that's kind of up to you and your design specs for that controller. And the animals have the same game to play evolutionarily, right? Mm-hmm. They have some gains in the system, some integrators that happen. Um, they have neurons or integrators, uh, and they have differentiators. They have all of that, but they have it in aces. I think that's the difference. And, and so we like to think of them as, I think the lingo is MIMO systems, multi-input, mm-hmm. multi-output, but all of them have gains, they could have differentiators, and they can have integrators, right? They can mm-hmm. have it all. And evolution doesn't care how complicated it is for us to unravel. It just cares that it works. That, And I'm going to come back to a slightly orthogonal view of this in a second. Here are the challenges, is you can take a human into a gaming system, And you can have them learn the game. And they could move a joystick to control a cursor, and you can adjust the game. (laughs) And they get pretty good at it. And you can change the game, and they get good at it. And by the way, you can reverse the game, and they can do that. It takes them a little while, but they can get there, right? You can have memory. You can have a differentiator. You basically put a human in a PID loop, and you can play the game, and lo and behold, you'll find out that they are able to do it, but their performance may vary with gain, with the differentiator, with the, with the parameters of your, in your loop control. And the same is true with animals. Uh, we can put and have put a moth in a visual world where it thinks it's flying, and as it flies, it can control in closed loop the horizon, its visual horizon. And how we do that is, a, is in the weeds. But it can control the visual horizon with a PID loop. And you can change the gain, and it can do that. It can learn to handle different gains, and you can even reverse the gain. And it has a hard time, but eventually it gets there. So the difference between the controller that you had historically made and the controllers of the future lies in learning, lies in the capacity of these closed loop systems to be adaptive, Mm -hmm. to be plastic in their responses. That's a very neuro-inspired feature. One of the other things that occurs to me, and I I hate to say it this way, like I I don't want us to confuse that uh, evolution has human intentionality, but it it sort of strikes me even in, in this example that evolution in in even a temperature control circuit for an animal is trying to solve a slightly different pro- set of problems uh, than than I'm trying to solve in the temperature control loop for an oven. And like one of those things may be robustness. Uh, and like the way that I achieve robustness in the in the design of this oven temperature controller is like I use parts. I understand uh, you know that this, op amp is characterized for proper function uh, inside of these temperature bands. I do a set of things to keep this thing inside of these. And so like I, I sort of balance a bunch of things, uh, honestly, in a very delicate way sometimes uh, to get this circuit to work in a way that my analytical brain can understand. Like I'm almost engineering towards uh, the simplicity of the control algorithm. And I like arrange all of these other constraints in the system around that so like I can understand like how the circuit is functioning and and that that is not what biology is doing absolutely so that's the next thread so I said there were two threads one <laughs> is are we really PID control systems and the answer is not really where are these uh, I, I think the phrase for uh, flight control is called fly by feel mm-hmm. basically we have data that comes in massive sensory data, we listen to it. We, living systems, right? And we learn 
to move in ways that get us to the goals we're seeking. This massive redundancy of information and our capacity to process on the fly, pun intended, (laughs) such rapid information, massive flows of information in tens of milliseconds on, on many, many channels to control dynamic movement, it just doesn't exist in synthetic systems. And that's the sweet spot of neural systems. That is this highly redundant, low noise, massively parallel sets of channels for sensory information. We haven't been building systems like that because of sort of the technical challenges of lots of sensors. I mean, if you can get by with five, why not get by with five and and, and just do that? Because there's some fabrication challenges that are of less concern naturally in natural systems. Well, and a lot of times it's it's sort of the, the cost thing that you mentioned before. So like having designed a bunch of things where you're going to bill 50,000 of something, like a penny here and a penny there matters. Um, whereas in biology, like if you can get these things for relatively low cost, like why not have a lot of them, right? That's right. I mean, it's not that cost isn't a criterion in evolution, the cost Mm -hmm. of fabrication or the cost of running thing. It's not like it isn't an an objective function on which evolution and selection may be acting, but it's only part of the problem. So at the end of the day, it's, is this thing going to survive and reproduce better than the other thing? (laughs) That's all that mattered, right? So cost matters to some extent, Mm -hmm. fabrication and running costs matter, but also robustness, stability, adaptability, the ability to fly under different circumstances, vastly different circumstances, to navigate, to tolerate falling, running into things. That's sort of the more natural uh, system approach, right? Living systems are, cost is a concern, but at the end of the day, fitness is the concern. Right. Right. And the cost is just one part of the of inputs it. into the fitness yeah, function. Part of it. Part of it. Absolutely. Yep. And so you could play an evolutionary algorithm on a design problem, and but you didn't have to make sure your objective function includes as many things as you want. Yeah, super interesting. You have this beautiful point of view because you've been doing this for a while. So what are some of the interesting things that have changed in the field other than like it being easier to do some of this interdisciplinary uh, stuff? Yeah, I would say there are probably three big transformations today that are going to propel the field much further forward than I will see in my career. Candidly, ML methods, machine learning, uh, is coming to bear on a vast number of problems in neuroscience. Everything from imaging to you know, how do we handle the massive data flowing in from neural systems? How does a brain handle massive data? Can ML give us some insight? So as we said not too long ago, there's lots and lots of channels coming in. That's a hard problem to do in traditional control theoretic approaches, right? This is hard. And by the way, they're nonlinear. You know, ML methods, I think the advent of AI and ML and our ability to grapple with massive data is transforming the field of neuroscience, period. It's transforming the field of movement control. We have the same problem in uh, understanding how multiple actuators operate a dynamical system and how millions of motor molecules conspire to create movement in muscle. These are all problems that re- demand extreme advances in computation, not just the hardware of computation, but the ML methods that are coming about. So even at my late stage of career, I'm finding myself having to learn more and more ML methods. This is great. This is exciting. So DNNs, uh, uh, even simple, just standard classification problems are mm-hmm. becoming increasingly important. That's, that's revolution one that's been going on. Revolution two is, of course, the advances in device technologies. So uh, an example of that will be the microfabrication of electrodes that you can implant in neural systems that record from hundreds 
of simultaneous sites. I almost said 1,000 because it's at about 900 and something, I think, on the latest Sharp Electro developed for mouse brain recordings. Mm -hmm. Those are now device technology and, of course, the ubiquity of microfabrication is influencing even how we make electrodes interfacing with natural systems. Okay, so now you have these two things. You have ML methods, device technologies, hand-in-hand, transforming our ability to understand the encoding and decoding processes of natural systems. So what's the third revolution? Third revolution, of course, is gene editing. Where is gene editing coming into all of this? Well, our ability to look at neural circuits depends on our ability to look at variants in these neural circuits, to turn them on, to turn them off, to use optogenetic methods, to use CRISPR, to change the chemosensory pathway on the antenna of an insect with really awesome electrodes inserted into it and ML methods listening in, right? So those are the three technologies I think are transforming not just neuroscience, I think it's transforming, they're they're all mutually transforming each other. Mm -hmm. That is, as we need to grapple with ever more complex data sets, I think that's driving development of ML. I think it's driving how we manage and control and handle rapid information flow. Just like real brains, computers are faced with this real-time challenge. Even the brain the size of a sesame seed does astronomical amounts of computing at tiny levels of efficiency. So there's lessons to be learned both ways. You can tell I'm really excited because I see these synergies and this sort of triumvirate of advances in gene editing, advances in device technology, and advances in ML. I have to say I'm I'm as excited as you are. And like one of the things that I, I wonder about is, you know, again, from from an engineer's mindset, you sort of think about all of these things. And part of what engineers do is like you build things that accomplish tasks, that solve problems, that hopefully, you know, do something useful, even if the utility is like just marveling at the, you know, the sort of ingenuity of the thing that you've, uh, you've made. One of the things that I'm starting to see is that the engineering process itself, sort of applying some of these techniques to very complicated systems, uh, whether they are the biological ones that we've been talking about today, or like they could be applied to some fundamental uh, aspects of physics, for instance, like, you know, understanding fluid dynamics and fluid flow. I think that as you take these tools, which can be used to build things, like you also at the same time can better understand the naturally occurring phenomena and that you're interacting with. You know, and so like this, this thing that you were talking about with gene editing and like understanding these neural systems, uh, like the thing that I've never understood, like as a non-biologist, is how much of the stuff that got built up in our biological systems is with intention and purpose and how much of it is, uh, you know, sort of unnecessary by some weird notion, like human anthropomorphic understanding of, uh, of, of utility. You know, the question with the human brain is like, you got 100 billion neurons in a human brain, you know, give or take. Are all of those necessary for cognition? I don't know. Mm, well, when you say cognition, what do you, you what need do to be mean? human? Do you need to be human <laughs> to have cognitive capabilities? And the answer is absolutely not. You can, you, you know, again, we can talk about cognitive capabilities in, in a vast or a taxonomic range of creatures. And uh, we can go down this path of cognition in honeybees. That's a very classic open uh, area of research. No, do we need all the connections um, to be functioning wonderfully and normally in society? Absolutely not. There are children, and now adults, who've had half their brain removed. And you would not be able to tell except for some minor motor deficits. I mean, hemispherectomy, okay? That alone is pretty stunning, okay? And yeah. it's a statement about the ability to take whatever circuits you have and to repurpose them. Mm-hmm. Therein lies the massive fundamental difference between sort of synthetic systems 
in living systems is that ability to be plastic. And in part, we built systems that aren't going to (laughs) change on purpose. We don't want them to change. Heaven forbid, you know, should should my car decide, you know, nah, I'm not going to do what you say, you know. Uh, I'm sorry, Hal, I can't do that. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So there's some parables here. So you ask, do we need everything? No. Can we map directly genotype to the phenotype of connections in the brain? Absolutely not. We cannot do that. That's because the connections are formed and lost and changed by use, by age, um, by growth. It's a different system. So getting back to your point is we need to understand these. We need to understand complex living neural systems towards inspiring new technologies, but also, even more importantly, towards dealing with neural disorders. And what happens when we lose connections? How robust is our sort of cognitive capability to this sort of loss of connections, notably like things like Alzheimer's and, and others, or, or motor diseases that are still have a central neural pathway like MS. You know, how, how can we understand and towards that understanding treat or compensate? I don't know whether or not any of your work is directed at things that are relevant to COVID-19 and viruses and upper respiratory things or you know, just just as a smart person I'd love to I'd love to get your take on not what we're doing right now which you know in various ways is both very inspiring and like very worrisome uh like i yeah. see some of the best of science uh, that i've ever seen happening and i've seen some just very problematic stuff happening but you go one step beyond it's like okay we we will deal with the the horrendous impacts of this thing at some point hopefully in the not too distant future probably not as soon as any of us would like but at some point we will either conquer the virus or adapt ourselves uh, to it is there anything that you think we should be thinking about to prepare ourselves for the next time this happens because it seems like there will be a next time yeah so this is i'm uh, getting a little out of my wheelhouse um but let me start by saying i i am both an optimist and a pessimist about this. Okay. So my optimism is I think there, you know, there will be a vaccine. Um, maybe not as fast as we'd like. I think society has an obligation to pay more attention to policies. This is not a scientific issue. This is a human behavior issue that are for societal benefit as opposed to individual benefit. I know that's a bit controversial, but even simple ideas, simple behavioral changes can make massive disease outcome differences. Yep. Again, it's not my it's not my wheelhouse, uh, but I'm enough of an analytics person to get it. In terms of scientific advances, there are again, not my wheelhouse, but there are new emerging antibody techniques, new emerging um, immunization methods that I think are worth investment. And if I were the great designer of all, (laughs) I would say, let's invest in education. Yeah. Let's make sure that our citizens have the basics of science, math, and social sciences that they need. It's It's not just a science thing. It's about the structure of societies, about demographics, I think getting a more quantitative training is better, but then I'm preaching to convert it here. I, I think if I were investing, I would invest uh, in education and communication of scientific concepts as critical as distancing and things like that. Yeah, and I, I could not more strongly agree with you. I think that's a nice segue into – I really would – love to understand your point of view on what those experiences could look like uh, for kids in middle or high school, 
you know, one of the great things about you is you're such an extraordinary teacher and, you know, you're really very interested in trying to convey these very complicated ideas about complex systems to as broad an audience as possible, which is really awesome. What do you think makes for a great educational experience? How do we get enough teachers uh, and mentors and advisors uh, to like do this stuff? Because it's hard. It is hard to, to be a teacher. You cut right to the nub of what I think of my justification on the planet is. <laughs> um, I love the science I do. I'm enthusiastic about the ability of science generally to help society. But I'm even more passionate about what can we do to uh, engage the next generation and engage as diverse a group of practitioners of, and now I, I want to say beyond science. I actually don't care. Just scholarly pursuit of knowledge. I There is such an important role for, for respect of scholarly pursuit of knowledge that you know, it's it's on all of us to help on that. Okay, so what what can make a difference? Um, I've always been really uh, fond of what I call the transitions in life. What happens between high school and college? What can we do in that space? Sort of the upper end of high school and the start of college. What experiences can kids have that can kind of help them through all the other machinery of college? And I love internships. I love learning by practice, learning through volunteer work, learning through paid internships. I, I'm particularly fond of paid internships for the reason that some kids actually can't afford to do volunteer work. And we need to be super sensitive to that. Yep. So I, I'm very focused on that. So I have high school kids in my lab. Um, I can't do whole high school classes, but, but there are a lot of labs in the world. And there are a lot of high school kids. And as long as there and there's businesses and industry and all of these can have a bigger role in welcoming the next generation just as experiences, just to give them a sense of what's going on. If you take all of society together and let that little bit of outreach everywhere, it makes a huge difference. The next transition is between undergraduate and either graduate, professional, or, or some other thing. In the life sciences, we see the vast majority of people receiving bachelor's degrees doing what we call a post-baccalaureate year, a year to further prepare them for medical school, dental school, physical therapy, graduate school, businesses, industry, you name it. That's a space where we lose a lot of people from science because you know they graduate, they need a job, they need to earn money. But if we can keep them in science and pay them, right? Nobody loses. Nobody loses. The scientists win. The student wins, right? Research advances and their career benefits and our progress benefits. I can give you story after story about students had no clue <laughs> that you could do research, had no idea you could do it, and then get into it and make a massive difference. And again, each of those transitions, those are the two dominant ones, the sort of high school to college, college to whatever. Those are the ones where I think there's a large impact to be had. As you proceed onward, it gets easier, but there's still critical transitions where we lose uh, underrepresented minorities and women into leadership roles in science and engineering and industry. And again, those are places where we we can do some investments smartly. Yeah. And it's, it's financial noise, by the way. Very much financial noise. I, I make the stronger statement uh, that it is for society uh, financially impoverishing not to make these investments. Uh, like we lose more than uh, the the savings that we think we're getting by not investing. I'm going to tip my hat to colleagues of mine in the biology department who spend whole careers thinking about exactly the question you're asking. They're really focused, in their case, on biology education, but more generally read on how students learn, how students learn science, what are best practices. I think the world is seeing a change in how we're teaching science. It's a little less sage on the stage, 
Okay. Just sort of core dumping. Uh, yeah. Although there are, you know, there are elements to that. And then there's a fair amount of very, very interactive work. I think um, there is ample room for technology to come in, in a smart way, okay, to help democratize access to science and learning. Things like I'm thinking about a particular project we did actually with Paul Allen uh, before he passed away on developing technologies that will help you learn how neurons work. And it wasn't, oh, let's make a cool movie of a neuron doing whatever it does. Students had to actually do the neuron game, <laughs> you know, putting the right proteins in that do the right sort of biochemistry and, and, and it could break and you could break them and you could get disease. It was a real neuron game. I, I really love it. And it was done with beautiful animation as well. And we used it live in the classroom. So the only challenge is that the professor, that was me, suffered incredible cognitive overload trying to <laughs> teach using this. But the students actually did really well. And we actually measured the difference in their learning using that method versus more uh, the, the way I normally teach. They did better. We brought up the underperformers, but the top end could go further than they would because they have a tool now to play some interesting things. I, I see a space for technology in that way. I see a space for the sort of education we've been doing over the last however many weeks. I taught neuroscience to non-majors uh, <laughs> for 10 weeks. It was really interesting. And these technologies would be incredibly useful. So how, how did, I, like, I'm really interested in that. You recently taught a 10-week uh, class, uh, so it was all distance learning, right? How was that? Uh, better than I thought. Um, what I missed, and I only got at the very end, was to see the 70 students in the class live. Yeah. And I didn't see them live because you can't get 70 faces on your monitor. And even if you could, uh, they'd be teeny. So what I miss is the visual interaction that you have when you're teaching. And what the students missed is the visual and personal interactions with each other. There's no question yeah. about it. And they all said that. At the end of the course, the students all had to do uh, PowerPoint presentations. Six slides, six minutes, sort of, uh, what is that, Pecha Kucha or whatever it's called. Right? Six slides, six minutes on a topic of neuroscience of their interest. And they did it in little teams. And we had sections meeting. So the class had a normal lecture, but they also had discussion sections where the TA would meet with virtually 20 students at a time or 15 or something like that. Uh, out of this class broken up into lots of sections. So the TA got to see them. And at, only at the end of the class did I get to see all these faces that were typing in questions on the chat or, you know, <laughs> emailing or, or, or whatever. I remember distinctly saying, God, I miss seeing the students. Um, yeah. And if you look at a picture of the class, which is a thumbnail of every student, you could be in any country in the world. It's really a beautiful, diverse group of students. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's a real, there's a real accessibility benefit for this. You know, and like you and I are probably, you know, for instance, doing this, uh, whereas if we had to be in person, even under non-COVID conditions, it would have been harder to schedule. And I mean, so like, I, I right. really do appreciate the flexibility that that these technologies are giving us. But I, I will just tell you from my point of view, one of the things that I worry about with distance learning is I was the type of student where whenever I encountered anything that was hard and I was struggling, I immediately assumed that I was stupid and that everybody else was smarter than me. And part of the thing that always helped me was being physically proximate with other students who I could see that they were struggling to like it, yeah. it was like, OK, well, yeah. this what I'm yeah. going through is normal. Like, I don't you know, I, I don't need to beat up myself uh, because this is hard. Uh, and then we helped each other uh, in a very sort of organic way. One of the things that I missed when like I grew up in rural central Virginia and I was like I was 
uh, very sparsely populated part of the country. And I spent a huge amount of my childhood alone. And so like, I just didn't have anything to benchmark myself to. And so I was just constantly, you know, wondering like whether I was on the right path, uh, and like creating that sense of community when we're distanced from one another. Like, I just sort of wonder how to do that. I'm not saying it's impossible. I just wonder how, how we do it. I so agree. Here is the the two tensions. One side of this distance learning is it is incredibly available to everyone, regardless of your income, given that you have access to technology. That, that's something we need to put yeah, a put very, a thumb, very, put a nail. Very in. important. We need to, but the class I teach could be taken anywhere in the world, theoretically. On mobile devices, small mobile, it's a little harder, but still feasible. That's the good news. There is democratization of science. The bad news is there's a loss of the interpersonal that comes with this. And as you point out, the other bad news is a sort of this isolation that is, I, I'm struggling, but I don't know, is it me? Right? Now, there, there are ways to help. They don't completely fix it. When we teach the class, there are no exams. An exam in this world is just nuts, if you ask me. I just that doesn't make a lot of sense. Rather, every day, there are questions that you have to answer. And you can do these breakout sessions. People can talk with each other. You can do all that now. That helps. But you can also see when I just do a simple poll of the class, hey, here's a question. What do you guys think is the correct answer? And lo and behold, you know, 30% get it, <laughs> 70% don't. Is it them or is it me? Chances are, if they didn't get it, it's not them. It's me. Again, there's aspects of distance learning that I think are good and aspects that are terrible. And today, we just live with what it is. It, we have to. We have to. And so we need to make the best of it. Yeah. And there are ways to improve it. Yep. Well, so we, uh, we're, we're almost out of time here. One last question for you before we go. I'm really interested to hear what you do outside of your, uh, your professional passions. What do you do for fun? It's a mix. I really love, uh, right now my wife and I just got an inflatable kayak. So that's what's top of my mind is to go kayaking. It's, by the way, that's fluid dynamics for real. Uh, (laughs) Also jazz keyboard. I I love playing piano uh, when I can get to it. Uh, Awesome. Uh, yeah, not good enough to give up my day job, but, um, uh, but it is so, so it's, it's really interesting. I'm, I'm an, uh, I'm not a very good, uh, piano player, but I am, uh, like an almost obsessive fan of the, the keyboard and particularly, uh, classical music. And that's another one of these things where when you see someone who is virtuosic, uh, at the keyboard, uh, you can, somehow or another, I think, deceive yourself into thinking that there was no struggle there, that, oh, my, my word, this person's a virtuoso. They're so, uh, they're so talented. Uh, like, you know, they, they must have this incredible genius. And yes, they have to be talented. Yes, you know, the very highest level performers, I think, probably are geniuses. But my word, you have to work hard to get yeah. to that point where yeah. all of it seems easy. Which is like, it's almost like a metaphor for teaching. I mean, my, like we, we look at great teachers and we're like, oh, what a, what, you know, how, how easy and wonderful this is. But man, it takes a lot of work to get as good at teaching as someone like you. Well, I, you know, I wish I was better at teaching. But I, I have to say that when you watch a virtuoso perform, the first word that goes through your head is, my, how lucky they are. Mm-hmm. Right. They are lucky that they get to do that. No, nah, they worked really hard. <laughs> they worked really, really hard. Yeah. And that is true for everyone who I think is successful, is they worked really hard. And it, that hard work is born out of a mixture of passion, but also reward. Yeah. Uh, if I step back to the neuroscientist in me, if, if I get rewarded for doing stuff, um, the dopamine pathways in my brain just all light up. <laughs> hey, let's do more of that, right? So, so that is our job as educators is to light up dopamine pathways. Okay, yeah. 
<laughs> That's awesome. Well, um, thank you so much for being with us today. This was just a great conversation, and it, it makes me happy to know that there are researchers and teachers like you out there in the world, uh, like making both great science and great students. <laughs> well, I have to say, Kevin, doing podcasts and making them available is also part of the fabric of science and discovery. So I have to say thanks to you because we want to get word out broadly to everyone about as many things as possible, right? Yep. Awesome. Thank Alrighty. you so much. All righty. Take care. So that was Kevin's chat with neuroscientist Tom Daniel. And what a fantastic conversation. What a really interesting guy. You guys talked about so many interesting things. So, yeah, I, Tom really is one of the most amazing scientists and educators that I've ever met. And I think he's really understated. You you sort of forget talking to him that he has won a MacArthur Genius Grant and that his research has been so transformative because he has this very natural way about him. And I think it may be one of the reasons that he's such a great educator. Yeah, no, that was what I was thinking. I was like, oh, I would love to take his classes. I would love to be a student in his classes because you just get the sense just from your conversation that you would learn so much because he's obviously brilliant, but has a fantastic ability to express that brilliance in something that is approachable and isn't going over your head and, and doesn't make you feel dumb. And that's what you want out of a great educator. And, and probably, frankly, I would think what you really want out of a great scientist. Yeah, in, in, indeed. I mean, I think a, a big part of science, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase something that I, I think some other famous uh, famous scientist said, is that um, your fundamental task is distilling extremely complicated things down to their simplest essence. Uh, and that's what you need teachers to do as well. Uh, and so the fact that he's able to bridge that gap, which not all people are able to do. There are some very brilliant scientists who do amazing work who aren't, uh, aren't equivalently brilliant at teaching. Right. Um, but you know, it, one of the reasons why I uh, chose the path that I did versus, uh, you know, versus remaining an educator is like, I couldn't figure out as a computer science professor, how to do as much of the educating part of my job as I felt compelled to do. And I always told myself that that was the highest impact part of my job, that I'm going to have a much bigger impact potentially on the world by uh, inspiring students to go off and have great careers in computer science than I am through the research that I'm doing. Yeah, no, I think that that's a great point. And, and being able to inspire people and have that impact is great. What was actually interesting, kind of speaking of education, is I loved the conversation that you two were having towards the end about what remote education is going to look like and some of the trade-offs between that, because that's something that I've been thinking a lot about in my own work, and I've kind of had the similar struggles that Tom was describing, where on the one hand, you have the democratization, as he was saying, of science, and uh, you know people have the ability, assuming that they have access to learn from wherever they are, but on the other hand, as you were kind of pointing out, you do lose that maybe sense of community and that ability to ask questions and feel like maybe you can ask questions. From your perspective, especially somebody who, you know, is, is has been a teacher and is involved in technology, I look at this and I think that this is something that technology might be able to solve, but I feel like it might be a design problem. What are your thoughts? Oh, I think it's probably more of a design problem than it is uh, a technology right. problem. Like the, I'm, I'm guessing that the technological building blocks are already in the place to mitigate a whole bunch of this stuff, and we we just have to figure out how to use them. We we may discover that there is for a whole bunch of things no substitute for proximity, and I'm yeah. guessing it's it's not a it's not a uniform thing. I would hazard a guess that I'm navigating all of this uh, social isolation that we have right now a little bit better than most because I've always been introverted. I've always been happy to spend huge amounts of time all by myself. But even for me, like it's this is a little bit much right now. Right, uh, <laughs> right. You know, that was that was like the meme, right? Is that everybody says, "Oh, you know, I've been preparing for this my whole life," but then you actually get into it and you realize, no, there are some instances where it doesn't work. I have to feel like there's something way, way we could design our systems to make it better. 
The thing that I'm hopeful about, and this has been my experience, and and I'd be curious about yours. I think both of us spend a fair amount of our fair amount of our working time is was remote already before yeah. this. Uh, so I I live in California. Like a big chunk of my job is in Washington State. Like I, I know you have a similar uh, similar dynamic. It was harder to do my work remotely before than it is now because I was often the only remote person. And it, now, at least, we're all in it together. And like a whole bunch of things have already improved, not because of technology, just but, but just because we're figuring out a culture of remoteness now that we right. weren't forced to figure out before. Yeah, no, I think you have a, I think that's a great point. When everyone is on the same playing field, you're not othered in that way. And I have a feeling that's probably also true for education, because although there have been MOOCs and online classes for decades, that hasn't been how a lot of professors have taught their classes, as Tom was explaining. And maybe next semester or in the future, that does become more expected part of the dynamic. And so that changes the approach and makes, you know, the I guess maybe the divide between, you know, people who are in person versus remote, even in education, less pronounced than it currently is. Yeah. And and like one thing that I, I, I think we should just remind everyone of, and Tom touched on it when we were talking about remote learning, is that it, it is not an equal experience right yeah. now because there are very substantial fraction of the population who don't have a device at home that they can use to to engage with remote education. They don't have a good internet connection. They don't have the support structure that they need. They don't have the time necessarily that they need to go avail themselves of these resources that are now available. And so in addition to sort of fixing the culture <laughs> of remoteness that we have right now, whether it's for work or learning, like we also have to fix these problems of access as well. Yeah, no, I thought that was a great point that he had that, yeah, you need to have that access. And that's something that we can work on and that I'm hopeful about will further the democratization, not just of science, but of education and and work and, and play and all kinds of other things. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, that does it for us. A special thanks again to Tom Daniel from the University of Washington. And as always, you can reach out to us anytime at behindthetech at microsoft.com. And please be sure to tell your friends, your colleagues, your students, if you're a teacher, your teachers, if you're a student, your you know, parents, your kids, whoever, about our show and be well. Yeah. See you next time.